Good afternoon. This is Between the Lines Live at SanduskyRegister.com. I'm Matt Westerholt, Managing Editor of the Register, and my guests this afternoon are Ohio gubernatorial candidate in the Democratic primary, Dennis Kucinich, and Bobby Kennedy Jr., an environmentalist, and uh, uh, we're going to introduce them, bring them in the frame in just a moment. I want to mention that Between the Lines is brought to you by Serving Our Seniors for Erie County residents age 60 and better. If you need help, call Serving Our Seniors, 419-624-1856. You can see all of our Between the Lines programs, and we've had a lot this week, and uh, more than a few, at snuskyregister.com slash BTL. And with that, I'll introduce our guests, Dennis Kucinich and Bobby Kennedy Jr. Thank you for coming back to Sandusky, and thank you for coming to Sandusky. Thanks, Matt. And have you ever been to Sandusky before? I've been through here a couple of times okay. with the speaking tours and campaign tours over the years. And you're here today to support Mr. Kucinich's candidacy? Yes. And uh, We've been friends for 40 years and allies on, uh, on issues from fracking to climate change to um, my lawsuits against Monsanto where he was a very, Dennis was a really early supporter and um, and every environmental issue over the past four decades. And now we're talking about Lake Erie. And, and Dennis, you've made this a part of your campaign. And I, I wanted to point out something that Tom Jackson, reporter Tom Jackson, Sandusky's uh, environmental reporter, po politics reporter, wrote an article about a survey that was sent to all statewide candidates uh, about Lake Erie and their views on Lake Erie. And you were the only gubernatorial candidate who answered that. Were you surprised by that? I, I was because uh, the preservation of Lake Erie, its aquatic environment, its source of fresh water, its commercial impact on, on the businesses along the lake, it's a, as a tourist destination with the islands and the shore. Uh, this is like one of the most important matters relating to the work of the next governor. Mm -hmm. And so when I, when I saw I was the only one who responded to that survey and reading uh, Mr. Jackson's article. Yeah, I was surprised. Absolutely. And, and does it does it show uh, that other candidates are disconnected? I know that might sound like a softball question, but you know, for us, Lake Erie is our most important natural resources. It's certainly one of the greatest natural resources on the planet. Well, it's the largest. The chain of Great Lakes, of which Lake Erie is a part, is the largest supply of fresh water in the entire world, as you just implied. And I would say that. Uh, as a prospective governor, I look at Lake Erie as being such a precious resource, and it's, it's, it's connected to life itself. The water is our life, but it's also a place that is of enjoyment, of beauty. There is nothing quite like it. And the islands where, you know, my wife and I honeymooned in this, in this area mm -hmm. and spent time on the islands, and it was just uh, the greatest moment for us. And we, we literally love this area. Mm -hmm. So uh, in running for governor, I feel a special responsibility from, you know, Conneaut, Fairport Harbor, all the way over to Toledo, including Sandusky, the islands, uh, Marblehead, to focus on, on water quality issues, on, the, uh, on matters that people really care about, which is to protect the lake from agricultural runoff, from uh, these confined animal feeding operations, from uh, a, the chemical agriculture, which is actually, you know, which poses such a threat to our, our drinking water that if if we had a lake that was dead here, we we this whole area would become a desert. So I'm I'm just very grateful that I've had the experience coming from Cleveland. Maybe part of the problem is none of the other candidates that could be it. are close to the lake. They, don't, they may really not know. It could be uh, it. But I do, mm -hmm. because uh, this is part of, of my growing up, where, you know, my connection with the lake. We'd, when I was a kid, we'd go with the family down on the lakefront, and we'd, we'd play, and just to be there and to see the boats go by and, and, and the beauty of it and the fresh air and everything. Once you get connected to that, you, you, it's part of you. Now, Bobby, you come from a family that's totally connected to, uh, to the water. Yeah, I mean, I grew up on the Cape, but my career 
has been protecting waterways. We have now 350 water keepers around the world. I'm the president and uh, founder of the Water Keeper Alliance here in Sandusky. Sandy Ben is our uh, Lake Erie water keeper. Mm -hmm. We patrol the lake and we um, track down the polluters and we ask them to comply with the law mm -hmm. and also to stop externalizing their costs and making the public and the people of this area and this region pay the costs of their production. And there are solutions. You know, you mentioned you have a, a lawsuit against Monsanto. I think you did. No, we have, uh, we have, I have a two large lawsuits, mm -hmm. national lawsuits against Monsanto. Um, one of them in federal court in San Francisco and another one in St. Louis, and that one is a failure to warn. Um, we now know that, uh, that glyphosate, which is the active ingredient of Roundup, is a carcinogenic, causes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and it's a suspected carcinogen with many other kind of cancers. It's in our food. It's a particular hazard to agricultural workers, but it also is getting in the water. Not only that, but when farmers in this region spread Monsanto on their land, it actually mobilizes the phosphorus out of the, out of the soil. Mm -hmm. It disconnects, the, it unbinds the phosphorus molecule from the soil and causes it to, uh, uh, to drift into, I'm sorry, right. Lake Erie. Um, he, I, when, when, uh, when Toledo lost, essentially lost its water supply from algae, 85% uh, of, uh, of the phosphorus, that comes from phosphorus, mm -hmm. phosphorus is a plant mm -hmm. fertilizer, when you put it in the water it, it becomes an aquatic mm -hmm. plant uh, fertilizer. And 85% of the phosphorus that comes down the Maumee River is coming from agriculture. And it's almost all of that is corporate or concentrated animal feed operations. There's 150 of them in that watershed. Each one of those animals, each one of those hogs produces 10 times the amount of fecal material by weight as a human being. So if you have a facility with four or five thousand hogs, it's the same thing as having a city of five thousand people with no sewage treatment plant. Mm. And all that ends up there today, there is more fecal and urine and uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria being produced by hog farms in the, um, in the western Lake Erie watershed than all the human beings in Los Angeles and Chicago combined. And it's not treated. There's no difference in terms of the danger to the environment, the virulence of hog waste compared to human waste, it ought to be treated if people are going to dump it in our environment. And there are solutions to treat it. There well, I mean, methods. the solution is, you know, the ultimate solution is, is called farming um, instead of, you know, instead of factory production of meat. I mean, we were okay. in 1950. It's called farming. Yeah, it's called farming. <laughs> And it's an old thing that they used to do before we built factories to produce our food. And, you know, in 1915, there were more hogs being produced in this country than there are today. Uh -huh. But they, they were enriching millions of farmers, or two million hog farmers in this country. And, you know, I, I watch what happened in North Carolina where factory farming was invented. When I first started working there, there were 28,000 independent hog farmers in the state, and they were making a living. And it was, and it was a good entry-level occupation for farmers because you could buy a, a saw, a, a sow, and a boar. You produce young, you feed them with your grain that you grow on the land, and and then you sell them, and you can make a living doing mm -hmm, that. Mm -hmm. But that all changed when Smithfield came in, essentially invented factory farming, dropped the price of hogs from sixty cents to five cents a pound, mm -hmm. cost thirty-two cents to to uh, a pound to get that hog to kill weight. So it put out of business every farmer in the state. And now hog farming in that state has been transferred from those 28,000 farmers are all out of business and it's now being done by 2,500 factories, virtually all of by 80% of them owned by one company, which is now a Chinese company. Mm. 
So that's the occupation of the American landscapes by a foreign company, the extraction of our wealth. That's colonialism. It's mm -hmm. not capitalism. Interesting, interesting. How do you get people to understand this? How, how do you get this message? Is that why you're here today supporting Mr. Kucinich's campaign? I, I'm supporting Dennis because we've been friends for 40 years. He stood by the environmental community on literally every single issue that has been on the radar for the past 40 years. And he's been willing to stand up against the Farm Bureau, which is the second most powerful lobby on Capitol Hill after the NRA against Monsanto, against the Koch brothers, against the oil industry, the coal industry, the big utilities. He has been willing to stand up for the American people, for our children. He's been fearless in doing that. So I wanted to come out. He stood by me so many times that I felt like it was my turn. <laughs> and Mr. Kucinich, how, how do you get this message across? How do you make sure voters know how important this is well, as an issue? Well, I, I, there's a couple things that a, a, a governor can do and that I will do. Uh, first of all, we need to have a shift in our agricultural practices. We need to move towards a regenerative agricultural model. Now, what does that mean? It means that we have to help farmers repair the soil. The, the soil is a microbiome. The, the health of the soil relates directly to the health of the plant and to the health of the planet. So we want to help farmers uh, learn how they can improve the quality of their soil. That, what does that mean? It means transiting away from this chemical agricultural approach that Monsanto has been promoting and to uh, essentially uh, use, use cover crops which uh, would enable the soil to recover from some of its current instability, but then to have farmers work on what we call carbon farming, where by improving the soil, uh, when you lay a baseline down of improving soil nutrition, it improves the ability of the soil to sequester more carbon. Now this some people would call it carbon farming, you can actually measure the, so the carbon content of the soil and you can, once you are able to measure it, you can then monetize it. So we can pay farmers for uh, improving their agricultural practices, sequestering more carbon. Now what happens when you do that? It has an effect on global climate change because what our problem is, that is that we have uh, um, uh, excessive levels of atmospheric carbon. You draw it down. Is How this you, a global warming argument? Because I thought well, that was no, it goes beyond that. Settled. No, it's not. Here's the thing, Matt. What it does is is that using the simple process of photosynthesis, right? The carbon, atmospheric carbon, is drawn down through the plant into the roots, increasing soil carbon content. It's it's healthier for the ex, external environment. It's healthier for the internal environment. Of, of the plant and the soil. So then what are you able to do? The soil then has more of a holding uh, power. You don't have that much, as much agricultural mm -hmm, runoff. Mm -hmm. One of the big problems we have right now is with chemical agriculture, the uh, soil is less compact and the, the agricultural, uh, the particular farming methods that are used uh, breaks up the soil and you have more runoff and as a result you end up with uh, uh, the chemicals that are being applied under the current well, practice uh, into the light. But let me ask you, this is known. These, these things that you're saying, they're known. They're practices that could be adopted right. and could be a solution to these issues that we're talking about. Right. There, there is no, there's really no argument that it isn't. What you're saying isn't true. M many people don't understand the details of it. But there are few ar few who argue that what you're saying is not true. So why isn't the industry adopting these changes? Well, let's take you know, H.L. Mencken said that it's very hard to convince a man of a fact when the existence of that fact will diminish his salary. And for a lot of the you know the big power players in the industry, like Smithfield and like Tice and, and like Monsanto. They're making money by poisoning so it's us. Their power, and they have economic power. 
You know, let me just give an example of what I saw happen in North Carolina. What Smithfield by overproduction, by, by moving hog production, and this is the same thing that um, Bo Pilgrim and, and Tyson and Purdue did with the chicken industry. Over a 15-year period, they moved chickens from being raised on farms to being raised in tiny battery cages in big factories where you shoehorn a million birds into that factory and you know, raise them, dose them with, with, uh, with hormones and with subtherapeutic antibiotics that cause them to literally lay their guts out over a short, miserable life. It's a factory, it's not farming. Mm -hmm. They were able during that period to put out of business two million chicken farmers in this country and, um, and make themselves billionaires. And they were able to control the market through monopoly control mechanisms and vertical integration. So, and, and, and huge subsidies from the federal government. So this has nothing to do with the free market capitalism. It's people who are actually escaping the discipline of the free market through, through monopoly control and subsidies. And what we need to do, and it's a total violation of Thomas Jefferson, it's an insult to Thomas Jefferson's vision of an American democracy rooted in tens of thousands of independent freeholds owned by family farmers. Smithfield Foods essentially is coming to control landscapes of this part of Ohio. And they already control 80% of the land mass in eastern North Carolina. That's not American democracy at work. That's colonialism. And they only maintain that control through their political clout, through subverting democracy, by subverting the free market and essentially eliminating local control because nobody wants one of these facilities in their backyard, so they have to get rid of the zoning laws. Absolutely, yeah. And, and that's what, I mean, that's what we're seeing. It's really a battle over our democracy, over our children's health, over public health. And we're battling very, very powerful forces, and that's how, how do you win that? Well, you, first of all, to let the public know that there is a battle going on to save the lake, that we don't just take it for granted. We don't accept this level of pollution, this encroachment on our environment. Uh, as as a governor, it would be my responsibility to uh, to make sure farmers aren't punished, that they're given a chance to uh, transition to a regenerative approach, which would mean. Uh, less likelihood of agricultural runoff, but with respect to these uh, CAFOs, uh, frankly, there are zoning issues, but nothing stops the uh, Environmental Protection Agency or the Ohio Department of uh, uh, Natural Resources from weighing in on this and to looking at the adverse environmental effects. And I can promise you that as a potential governor, I intend to protect the quality of our lake's water, which is vital to all, not just all the communities on the lake, but inland communities that mm -hmm. depend on the mm -hmm. water as well. And how do you do that? How do you convince the Ohio legislature? I mean, this sounds like yeah. you have to make major reforms. How would you convince the Ohio legislature to enact major reforms? It shouldn't be difficult because this is part of the economy of our state. It's essential to the economy of our state. There are some legislators in this region who have already taken a position that have shown a recognition of the challenges that we face here, and that's a good thing. So I don't think that there'll be a difficulty being able to bring together Republicans and Democrats to stand for water quality, because otherwise the, the business investment here is adversely affected, the property values of residents are adversely affected, the uh, ability of people to, uh, uh, to uh, not just get water from the lake, but to use the lake for recreational uh, uh, purposes, adversely affected. This, I, I see this as being one of the number one concerns of the next governor of the state. And, and I'm ready to address it. And you know, with, with advice from people like uh, Bobby Kennedy, uh, and you know, with his environmental experience and others, I'm quite confident that we can be vigilant to protect the quality of water, we can help farmers move towards a more regenerative approach, have help the sportsmen, the fishermen, and others who use the lake, and to uh, make sure um, that no one will ever have to worry about what Toledo had to worry about a few years ago, which is whether you're even going to have access to clean water anymore. Now, I'll just say add one other thing. A CAFO, a factory farm, cannot produce a pork chop or a pound of bacon 
cheaper or more efficiently than a traditional family farmer if they don't have the subsidies and the government control. They could not last a day in a free market. They, they could need not that last yeah, a day in a free market. And, no. and, and you know, Bobby just said something I want to add to, uh, <laughs> that this should not uh, be, uh, fail to be mentioned, this should not, uh, we should not fail to mention this. These interests have a hold right now in Columbus. How did we get the situation where there, you had this uh, high algae blooms? How does that happen? Are there scientific reasons why? Yeah, but there are political reasons why. And these interest groups have a hold on big law firms and, and lobbyists in Columbus who you know, have adversely influenced the legislature. And uh, when a governor steps forward and says, uh, my friends, we're going to go in a direction of protecting this and any of these people that are trying to subvert the interests of the people who live along the lake uh, are going to find that they're going to have a pushback they've never had before. And, and do you think you'll be able to break that hold, the absolutely. hold of the lobbyists? Ab well, absolutely. Because this As is, governor. Absolutely. Otherwise, why run? I mean, if you don't think you, you have the ability to challenge these interest groups that have, that have created this mess, through their hold on our politics, then you shouldn't do it. But I'm ready because I'm, I'm independent. I have the ability to uh, be able to bring people together but at the same time to challenge the interest groups who have, uh, who have been able to let this agriculture runoff uh, uh, increase, uh, let the uh, confined uh, animal feeding operations uh, dump what amounts to you know, waste of the worst kind into our rivers, goes into the lake and across uh, from west to east. We're, we, we're going to change this, and we have to, for our, not just ourselves, but as Bobby said, future generations are relying on us to pre protect us. This is, our, this is our responsibility now, to protect the, the natural capital of our, mm -hmm. of our state. I want to ask you about water keepers, but, you know, and you might merge this, or I'm merging it. Uh, and what water keepers is and what it means. But I also want to, maybe before we go there, to, to ask you, where do you think we're going to be in five years in this battle? Uh, how, how, can you talk about what, you know, what it would be like if you had the victories you want, how it will be different? Well, uh, if, if Scott Pruitt the remains at EPA, EPA director, um, there's nothing good that's going to happen to the environment so, in five years. So I think it, it would be a very, very pessimistic. You're calling for his resignation? Well, I, I think, yeah, that, I mean, uh, there's a whole sort of cultural ethic that is, uh, yeah, he, <laughs> yeah. He, he does not belong at EPA. Scott Pruitt is the U.S. EPA director under yeah. fire, right? I mean, you know, I'm... I'm naturally optimistic, and I think it, the basis for my, I think you have to be optimistic. And in order to, to engage in the kind of fist fight that I've been engaged in for 35 years as an environmental advocate, and that Dennis, you know, Dennis is, you know, Dennis is like, is the Bernie Sanders of Ohio. He was Bernie Sanders before there was Bernie Sanders, and that's what you need. You need a disruptor who will come along and, you know, and we need to change use that things. Quote. <laughs> so, um, uh, and, you know, disruptors can change things. And Donald Trump, you know, if he's shown us anything, he's shown us that. that you, if you have a disruptor, he can change things. He can, you know, destroy institutions and do away with things. And I think he's doing away with a lot of good things. But a disruptor, if we had uh, Bernie Sanders there instead of Donald Trump, I think he can make changes that were as disruptive and as dynamic. My own optimism comes from the, my knowledge of technology. We now have technology to solve most of our environmental problems. The question is really political will. To build a power plant now, a um, solar power plant, which is what one of the things that I do, it costs about a billion dollars a gigawatt. A coal or gas plant costs five billion dollars a gigawatt. So if we really had free market capitalism, again, you, the carbon incumbents would have would go on the way of the dinosaurs. Um, electric cars are going to very quickly uh, displace internal combustion engines because they drive better, they're cheaper to drive, they're more powerful, and people want them. And it's going to be the markets that drive them there. Mm -hmm. 
Generally speaking, markets favor efficiency, and efficiency means the elimination of waste and pollution is waste. So if we can really make markets function, I believe that we will um, we'll be able to save great swaths of our environment for our kids. The problem is really a political one, is that the incumbents, the oil companies, the coal companies, the Monsantos and chemical companies maintain their position of economic dominance by dominating the political process and buying off our politicians. Our political campaign funding system is just a system of legalized bribery. And they know how to manipulate it. And that's, we're living in their world. And we need to change that and live in a world that we're proud of. And that's why I'm supporting Dennis. Very good. So an environmentalist is a free market capitalist. I believe that a true free market capitalism is the most important thing that can happen to the environment. And a, a true free market promotes efficiency. If efficiency means the elimination of waste and pollution is waste. In a true free market, you can't make yourself rich without making your neighbors rich and without enriching your community. But what polluters do is they make themselves rich by making everybody else poor. You raise standards of living for themselves by lowering quality of life for the rest of us. And they do that by escaping the discipline of the free market. You show me a polluter, I'll show you a subsidy. I'll show you a fat cat using political clout to escape the discipline of the free market and force the public to pay his production costs. That's what all pollution is. It's the externalization of costs. This is corporate welfare? Yeah, that's what it is. Pollution is, if you're dumping your, your, your waste yeah. into the, I mean, the, in a true free market, an actor in the marketplace pays all the costs of bringing his product to market. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what polluters do is they figure out a way to get the public to shoulder their costs. And what we do as water keepers and environmentalists is try to force them to internalize their costs, which then sends the proper signals to the marketplace, which is efficient. Interesting. It's an interesting way to see it and look at it that I don't think people fully understand. Um, and I thank you for being here and, and talking about that. And I did want to just touch base on water keepers. Well, I want to touch base on water keepers and, and your view of that and how you're supportive of that. And I also want to touch base on your tour this morning and today, Toledo, Marblehead, Sandusky, and what that means and why you're doing it. So let's go with water keepers first. Water Keepers um, is the largest and fastest growing water protection group in the world. We now, it was started on the Hudson River by a blue collar coalition of commercial and recreational fishermen back in 1966 who mobilized to reclaim the river from its polluters. They were main, almost all former Marines. They came back after Korea in World War II and found the Hudson, was, they couldn't resume work and they discovered an ancient navigational statute called the 1888 Rivers and Harbor Act that allowed individuals essentially to sue polluters and collect bounties. And nobody had ever done it before, and they began doing it. They collected hundreds of thousands of dollars in bounties. They used the money to construct a boat. They began patrolling the river, and they've sued over 500 polluters to date. We've collected over five and a half billion dollars, which we've returned to the river. And today, the Hudson is an international model for ecosystem protection. It's a, it is, you know, and its miraculous resurrection has inspired the creation of these other river keepers around the world. And we have one here in Sandusky. We have a, our Lake Erie Sandy Bend, our Lake Erie water keeper. But now we're, you know, we have explosive growth throughout the Midwest. Very good, and Dennis. Now, I, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about our experience today, which began in Toledo on the banks of the Maumee. Incredibly beautiful moment at the park, but also mindful of the fact that all this pollution flowing into the Maumee goes up to uh, the mouth of the lake and then is churned around and comes uh, our way, mm -hmm. east. And you think about the tradition, how many uh, hundreds of years people have enjoyed this area, but now all of a sudden it's under, it's under threat. And then I think about water. Water is sacred, literally sacred. I mean, water is used to baptize people. Just, water has a spiritual nature. 
and, and it, it refreshes us, it gives us life, it is the basis for, uh, for human existence and human progress. We must treasure it, we must act as, as it is our greatest treasure, not something that we would ever permit anyone to foul or to poison. So as the next governor of Ohio, I intend to treat water for the, how essential it is to our existence and to fight for the people every day to protect it and to have environmentalists who will join in my effort and to be ever vigilant of, of the quality of our water. Very good. Thank you. And let's just talk, how is the campaign going? Are you enjoying the campaign? Oh, or listen, I enjoy, you know, I wanted to make sure that we brought uh, Bobby Kennedy to Sandusky to uh, show him the community and also because this community is part of the engine of what moves this whole four county area and mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure Bobby saw it and, you know, this is more than a campaign stop. This is uh, a, uh, an example of what's possible in a community when you have strong leadership as Sandusky does and at the same time, if you get some help from Columbus, uh, a lot of Very things good. can happen. Well, thank you so much for thank being you. on Between the Lines and thank stopping you, here today and, and sharing your thoughts and, you. and helping our readers and viewers understand these issues in more depth so they, they know the importance of these issues. We appreciate you taking the time to thank come you. here today. It's thank very you. nice to meet you, sir. You too. With that, that's it for this segment of Between the Lines Live at SanduskyRegister.com. You can watch all of our segments at SanduskyRegister.com slash BTL.